my screen now. Great. We're live and people are starting to join. Great. So welcome folks as you join, we'll get going just a moment. It takes a moment to weave everybody into the meeting. Just give it a moment. Welcome, welcome. <clears throat> Okay, so good morning, everybody. This is a meeting of uh, the advisory committee of Maine's offshore wind roadmap process. It's lovely to have folks with us this morning. Um, and uh, just a word on Zoom this morning, we're using a Zoom webinar and the folks you'll see on the screen are the members of the advisory committee, as well as some key staff and some consultants that are joining us today uh, for the work, for the technical work. Um, everybody else, um, our observers today in the Zoom webinar, thanks everybody for joining us, either as an observer or a member of the, of the committee. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. And why don't I turn it over to your co-chairs for some introduction, and then I can go ahead and share an agenda of our, our 90 minute meeting today. So uh, Admiral Johnson and Director Dan Burgess, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, David, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for making the time to uh, join us. I think we have some critical information that we'll be getting today that will help inform our decision-making going forward. This is technical and consultant work that's been going on uh, since we began meeting, and it's finally coming to fruition, and uh, we're gonna benefit uh, from, from that work as we go forward. And that builds on the superb uh, field day that we had on the 25th of May down in Harpswell, which certainly is going to go a long way to help inform our decision-making going forward. And I'd like to uh, call out Terry and Patrice and Ben uh, for helping organize the event and, and the actual execution of it. Terry, along with Ed Muncy and Matt Gilley and Allison Hawks uh, made the day uh, productive. I also wanna call out the members of the greater Harpswell lobstering community that showed up uh, and spent the afternoon with us. Uh, I found that very helpful and, and I hope it was informative for them. And it certainly, I think, uh, identified or, or highlighted the spirit in which uh, all we take uh, working with all of the interested parties in this important endeavor that we have underway. Also want to mention uh, the people who participate in the afternoon session up at the community center, Don Perkins and Carla Gunter, and Deidre Gilbert and Carl Wilson from DMR. Uh, I think, uh, again, that was important information that will inform us as we go forward. And finally, all the while that we've been, uh, this has been going on, the working groups have continued to meet and continue to refine their recommendations. And of course, coming Wednesday, the 20th of July, uh, we will be dig beginning to dig into with uh, the uh, recommendations. Uh, more fully. And again, to all of the uh, advisory committee members who made the effort to be in Harpswell and we had near perfect attendance, those of you today uh, who have carved out the time to be with us and then again, coming on the 20th, I hope that you've all been able to block off time for that day because these subsequent meetings will be increasingly important as we begin to pull together what will be our final report. Again, it's great to be back. Thanks, David, and your team for what you've pulled together for us today. And I'll turn it over to Dan. Thanks, Krog. I appreciate the uh, intro. And I would, I would just, um, um, you know, uh, add on to what you said. To uh, it was great to see everyone in person. Uh, uh, spent a lot of time reflecting on, you know, just the uh, nature of the day, and and kind of uh, really appreciate all the work that went into it. And um, I feel like there's been a lot of work that's happened between then at, at the advisory group, I mean, at the uh, working group level. And so I'm really excited to kind of get some of the um, information today and as we as we look to consider it. I, I did want to note that um, you may have seen in the in, in the news that the uh, uh, Biden administration has created a, a federal state uh, partnership, um, uh, really a kind of working group among states to look at offshore wind supply chain opportunities. and. Uh, the state of Maine is one of 11 states participating in that effort that was kicked off uh, last week, really focused again on kind of uh, the supply chain opportunities and how to coordinate among states and the federal government in 
and um, uh, other interested parties. And you know, in our participation, we've made it clear that we've you know we've got this process um, uh, going going forward right now. We've got uh, many folks involved in this, and that we want to make sure that the the voices here are uh, represented in the conversations that we're having there. Um, so. Um, really excited about the uh, uh, agenda for today, and I'll leave my remarks at that so we can get to it. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Grog. That's great. Um, let me just share a quick agenda to follow up on, on those comments. Um, and what we have today are the key consultants that have been accompanying the working groups in this process and you all's advisory committee. And we're trying to do a concise overview of really the nut of what we've got in each of these pieces and threading these sto this storyline together. We're going to start out looking at the offshore wind uh, marketplace and particularly scenarios for Maine um, and New England. We've seen this and we're going to see it with more detail today, detail that we haven't yet seen. We're then going to move on and talk about two things that are about a responsible approach. One is the socioeconomic analysis. We're going to get a very quick hit on that, but there'll be a subsequent deeper dive in a webinar and workshop um, uh, in July. And then we're also going to hear about the mapping exercise and how that's trying to address impacts um, on uh, environmental wildlife uh, issues and on existing ocean users and fisheries. Finally, we're going to use uh, check in with our two consultants, Exodus and BW Research, on the supply chain and workforce issues, right? So some of this you've heard, what we're doing is packaging it together and giving the latest pieces of the consultant reports as they're finishing up their work um, in these months. All right, we'll do a quick, hit at the, a quick hit at the end, anticipating our work in July. We're coming together uh, in person in July uh, to work through the recommendations coming out of the uh, working groups. Okay, uh, as always, we have some sort of basic guidelines about what we can expect from each other. We still need to understand uh, different viewpoints uh, uh, from each other. And so we need to expect that of each other. We have to be open to new ideas and assume good faith. Okay, great. Um, before we jump into the work with DNV and the energy markets and scenarios place, I wanted to just do a quick connecting question for um, folks who are um, on the advisory committee. And um, I'll drop it in the chat, the question I want to do. Um, if you could just take one second, if you were down in the Cundies Harbor visit back in May, um, I'd love to just do a quick reflection in the chat. How did that visit to Cundies Harbor impact, do you think, our work going forward? So just take a moment, drop something in the chat, I'll, I'll give folks a moment to think about it because it's not necessarily immediately obvious. Um, but advisory committee members, if you could just drop something in the chat, a quick phrase, that would be great. If you if it's easier for you to just shout it out, then type it in the chat. Open up your mic and shout it out too. There's no no problem with that. Monk, monkfish stew was high on my list, which I'm yeah, saying. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thanks to Ben and his monkfish stew recipe. Yeah. Other things folks want to put, go ahead and drop it in the chat or, or just open up your mic. Just give it a moment. Great. Thanks, Hannah. <clears throat> Thanks, Don. I press return too quickly. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. But I think just appreciating Don is fine too. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, Neil. Wing, that's great. Okay, wonderful. Okay, feel free to keep dropping some things in there. <clears throat> in the interest of time, we're gonna dive forward as I mentioned, the first piece of this is with our consultants, DNV, and here from DNV, we've got a couple folks leading that will be Ari Mickelson. Um, and 
they've got slides um, around sort of the overall marketplace, many of which you've seen already, but we're trying to really synthesize it down. And then we're gonna go into the scenario analysis and put so, a little more detail into that scenario analysis of Maine's energy needs and the region's energy, energy needs and what that means for offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine. So Ari, let me turn it over to you. Feel free to share your own slides. If you need me to share, let me know. Great, thanks, David. Is it up here? Can folks see my screen? Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all again. Uh, I've been. Uh, my name is Ari Michelson. I'm leading DNV's effort, um, working with the Governor's Energy Office and primarily the Energy Markets and Strategies Working Group um, on a lot of the research that we've been doing. Um, we have a team of of uh, analysts and consultants, really from around the world. Um, working, uh, worked on this, really pulling in uh, some of the insights that, that we have here at DNV. And so um, I want to walk through a, a few pieces as, as David just really teed it up well. Uh, the first section of that is the state of the offshore wind industry. And the uh, first uh, piece here in, in terms of setting the backdrop for this is, is really decarbonization and, and electrification. And so you'll see a few graphs here in this section from DNV's energy transition outlook. Uh, and this is an independent model of the world's energy systems out to 2050. It forecasts the energy mix, supply and demand globally, and then across 10 world regions. Um, you know, transition outlook is, is a good definition of, of how uh, we see things at DNV, really a transition from you know, fossil fuels to renewables shouldn't surprise uh, most of you, uh, but this graph here is showing the energy demand in North America out to 2050. And I wanna call it a couple of things really just to set, set the agenda for today. Um, first we see um, overall demand is decreasing and it's really primarily driven by the oil, which is in green here. It's getting narrower over time out to 2050. And, and more of that is shifting towards uh, electricity, uh, which is the blue here. And we see two things. We see the electricity line getting wider. Um, so increasing overall, and then it's a larger percentage of the overall demand, um, especially as we get to those out years, really decarbonization, really driving uh, this effort, um, state policies and legislation, really looking at increasing the use of renewables and meeting those electricity demands. And that's an opportunity for renewables, um, as well as offshore wind. And we have some market trends in development. Uh, I did share this slide back uh, in December, but just wanna to touch upon it again briefly. Really it's just showing projections of offshore wind development, both globally on the left-hand side here, and then for the US on the right. Uh, worldwide, there's about 750 gigawatts of offshore wind in the 2020 uh, timeline. Um, and we see about 5% of that is, about, is offshore wind right now. And we see exponential growth on both fronts, really uh, from 2020 to 2030, both, both globally in the US, and then again, from 2030 to 2050. Um, huge increases here, uh, really showing the potential for uh, both fixed bottom and floating offshore wind uh, globally in the US, and then we'll, we'll, we'll hone this in on Maine here in the coming slides. Costs are a key driver for this industry growth. Um, there are many different projections of costs uh, out there. Uh, the actual numbers do vary, but really what's consistent is that there's a disparity in the current costs between fixed and floating wind um, today and uh, large decreases in, in both, but primarily or, or principally in the floating really getting down to be cost competitive with fixed uh, wind uh, in the out years there. Um, this graph is from um, the DNV energy transition outlook um, showing um, a decrease by 80% by 2050. Uh, the, the, the similar graph in, in the US and North America, it, it looks quite similar. Uh, there's some other projections in Maine really getting uh, even lower than this down to, to maybe $39 per megawatt hour out by 2050. So we have decarbonization and, and this drive towards electrification. There's an opportunity for renewables, particularly offshore wind um, driven by costs. Uh, and then the other piece here is, is, well, is the policy side and, and so what's happening. And so um, throughout New England, there's aggressive clean energy goals, um, really driving renewable development uh, forward. Um, there's 35 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, in the pipeline, nearly all fixed bottom. Uh, what this graph shows is most of those wind energy areas and project developments throughout the East Coast. And what you'll notice here, this also shows the ocean depth um, and all of these projects are in shallower waters, really less than 60 meters. And those are all pretty much all fixed bottom uh, projects. 
And what I'll also point out is in the Gulf of Maine, up here um, in federal waters where, where offshore wind will be developed, it is uh, the darker blue, deeper water, and thus uh, will we'll need floating offshore wind. I know we've talked about this in the past, but just wanted to, to highlight that as well. Um, as you're aware, the, the BOEM uh, wind energy area designation is scheduled for next year, 2023, with a lease sale in 2024, and so we're expecting that to be floating wind. I'm going to take a pause here, um, sort of on this backdrop, um, before we move on to the specific scenarios. Um, really looking at, as I just mentioned, the shift of the floating offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine is really where the opportunity is. Uh, there's plenty of efforts underway in the universities and broader, and you'll hear some of some of more about that later on today. And then the growing competitiveness of fixed and floating, uh, really to meet that decarbonization-driven demand. So with that, I'll, I'll pause, see if there are any questions, um, or we can keep going um, into these scenarios. Yeah, Ari uh, Grog Johnson, the uh, fields that were just auctioned off, off New York, uh, is that gonna be, or is there some floating in that as well, do you know? As a primary fi fixed bottom is what that will be there. That's still in the uh, shallower area. It's down in this area over here. Oh, sorry, down over here. Super, Ari, right. I'd, I'd, I'd roll forward, Ari, into the scenarios, and then we can do some questions together between the scenarios and this, uh, in the, this market analysis. Sounds great. All right, so um, we're, we're, what, what are the, the main tasks that we've been working on here is trying to understand uh, what the renewable energy needs are for Maine and New England and how Maine resources, both onshore um, in Maine and, and offshore in the Gulf of Maine uh, can help supply that. So um, this first slide here is really conceptual, um, how we're thinking about that. And then we'll get into some more details about the, the demand and the su supply side. So conceptually, we're trying to understand the total demand for Maine and for New England. Um, and that's re representing by this, this bar here, um, what's needed to supply uh, the electricity. And then we're looking at what states are doing through renewable por portfolio standards and, and others, uh, really what are the commitments towards renewables? And that gives us what percentage of this total demand needs to be renewables. And that's this light blue bar. Um, of course, there's plenty of activity happening already. And so there's, there's existing renewables and there's pipeline renewables. And we're factoring that into our modeling to understand, okay, what's already happening or, or likely to happen in this uh, blue shading. And that leaves what's in green here, which is what's left in order to, uh, what's left for additional renewable development to meet uh, what's needed. And that's what we call that the renewable net short or, or the remaining need. And that's where we're looking in our models. Well, what can be done onshore in Maine to help that, and then what could be done offshore in the Gulf of Maine, uh, really both for Maine and, and for New England. So I wanna jump into demand and supply, and then we'll get into the results here. So looking at demand, there's a lot of different projections out there from a lot of prior reports um, and, and analyses about what demand could look like. Uh, this graph is, is trying to show uh, a number of them and there's not a, a dot for every year for every report. We're, we're taking the data that's out there, trying to understand where, where is demand going? And you can see a, a pretty wide range really from, from a low of about 180,000, this is gigawatt hours uh, by 2050, all the way up to you know, about 300,000. And so uh, we're looking at the, the data uh, that's out there and the data that we have. So there's been some prior work here in Maine, particularly uh, from the Maine Climate Council. Um, and, and we're using that, that resource and, and came up with, uh, after looking at all of this, two levels of demand. And it's important to note that you know, they're both, these, these, all of these numbers on this graph here represent you know, decarbonization scenarios and, and uh, you know, the projections range. And so uh, we wanted to range that and, and understand how varying levels of demand affect uh, what might happen. So uh, what we have is a base demand here, it's about 220,000 gigawatt hours. Um, and then we have a high decarbonization demand up to about 270,000 gigawatt hours um, out by 2050. So there is some disparity between those and that's what we wanted to do in the model. And again, we're talking about New England demand. Uh, for Maine, we're using the, the data that came from the Maine, Maine Won't Wait effort from the Maine Climate Council, which had a, a Maine uh, projected demand and that's what we wanted to use uh, for this work. So that's the demand side. Uh, and then the supply side, we're trying to understand what well, we're looking at onshore in Maine and offshore in the Gulf of Maine. And we wanted to understand you know, 
what onshore constraints and, and how on, onshore constraints could affect what happened. And so we have three supply scenarios that we're looking at, really look at varying different levels of, of onshore development. So this first one here is the constrained onshore development. That's where we're, we're limiting um, everything sort of onshore beyond the current legislation and pipeline. So that includes uh, the LD 1710, the Northern Maine Renewable Energy Development Program, about 1200 megawatts of onshore development, and then another about 800 megawatts of what's already in the pipeline and, and underway. And so that's sort of a, a constrained path saying, okay, this is what's what's out there that we're, we're fairly confident on, but uh, there's, there's challenges for doing more of that. And so that's the first supply scenario we want to look at. The second the one here shown in the middle is this unconstrained onshore development that's really placing no limitations on what could happen onshore. Uh, this is a, a less realistic scenario, but, but it really helps us sort of stress test what we're trying to understand and, and what could be what could happen onshore if there were no constraints, although we all know there are, there are constraints in terms of transmission and getting things around and, and grid upgrades and all of that. And finally, on the right here, we're showing the, a diverse portfolio, which is more of a middle ground, uh, borrowing elements from both of the other supply scenarios. So we're taking the constrained development and adding some additional onshore development, about another gigawatt up to 3,000 megawatts um, onshore, and then uh, pulling in some of the same assumptions from the unconstrained to try to understand what that would look like. So that's really the background, uh, how we're approaching this, what the demand looks like, what the supply uh, levers are that we're adjusting. And then let's get into the results. Uh, we're gonna talk first about Maine and then for New England. Um, I'll spend a little time orienting us on this graph and then you'll see when we get into New England, um, similar outputs here. So what this is showing is uh, each of the scenarios, the constrained, the diverse and the unconstrained, um, each year, 2030, 40 and 50, which were the years that we, we looked at and we see varying amounts um, and the, we're showing onshore uh, solar and onshore wind in yellow and blue and then the offshore wind uh, is in green here. Uh, you know, we're looking at three different time periods, 2030, 40 and 50. Um, it's important to know that the reality is, is more nuanced. It's not all of a sudden you get a jump in 2040. You know, these projects take a long time to develop and, and you've seen that in, in development, even in the fixed bottom and the, uh, around the East Coast. And then for floating, it can really be seven to 10 years from the lease sale, which we talked earlier is happening in the 2024 20, timeline. And really seven to 10 years by that before we, after that, before we see projects operational. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in those uh, initial years, whether it's you know, transmission queue studies, uh, other infrastructure uh, analysis and development. Those are things that some of those happen outside of the Bowen process. And so um, calling out that you know, in order to, to, to see this work and, and the development happen, you know, from 2030 to 2040, work needs to happen soon. And, and it's kudos to this, this roadmap for, for really um, trying to, to understand what that is and, and, and keep things moving forward. Uh, I've put a box here around the diverse portfolio scenario. It is the middle ground scenario and, and what we've used in a lot of our subsequent analyses, um, try to understand what could happen here. And I've shown sort of the total megawatts of development by 2050. So, so this is really to meet main uh, demand um, yeah, by 2050, under this diverse portfolio, it's about two gigawatts of offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine. So that's where we are for Maine. You know, these other scenarios are, are, are out there, there, but we're, we're focused on the diverse portfolio for, for our additional uh, research. And let's talk regional for New England. So uh, the New England results include Maine uh, and, and more. And we have those two demand levels. We have the base demand on the left here and the high carbonization decarbonization demand. The graphs, oh, I think I want to call this out where the scales are different. So all the graphs look similar uh, here. Um, this is the high decarbonization really out by 2050 is, is um, overall is, is double, if, if not more, what we're seeing in the base. Uh, but this helps us understand what's happening. And, and similar to what we saw in the main uh, scenario, uh, really in 2030, uh, there's not a whole lot of, of offshore wind development. And some of that is the timeline we just talked about. Um, the projects that we, we are seeing, and this is consistent across all of that in the Gulf of Maine, are the research array, 144 megawatts, as well as the 11 uh, megawatt Monhegan project. So a total of 155 megawatts, which we see in Maine and in the regional results. Uh, and then we get out um, in, in the outer years and the, and the um, 
depending on the supply scenarios, we see different different amounts of development, but focusing on, on the diverse portfolio in this space, which is the lower decarbonization scenario, we're seeing about 3.3 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050. Um, and you see the, the primary growth there uh, coming between 2040 and 2050. And then in the higher decarbonization scenario, we're seeing a growth sooner, um, but in substantial growth to, to meet that higher New England demand uh, up to about 11.2 gigawatts there. Um, you know, another, the question that always comes up here is, okay, well, well, where is this going to be? How is it going to connect? What does transmission look like? Uh, and it's something that that um, needs a lot of attention. I just want to call on that a little bit here. Um, and I think we heard this this up front in, in some of the, the comments about the, the in-person uh, uh, event is really the stakeholder engagement is, is critical here, particularly you know throughout the whole process, but particularly in transmission, trying to understand uh, what's needed, um, where things might go. There's lots of moving parts, organizations and developers that will need to be engaged, uh, even more so if, we're, if transmission is coordinated uh, with other New England states, really need to understand that. Uh, we've done some analysis as part of our effort and showing that there is some headroom in Maine uh, at multiple locations, and, and this graph is showing that a little bit. Um, the, the greens and oranges are, are showing uh, onshore and nearshore substations that have some room, uh, but it's likely that there will be upgrades required both for the onshore and the offshore levels that we're showing in the results. The actual locations of where this will go are largely unknown and, and, and really that full design of transmission uh, will need some more information from the process about the wind energy areas um, and where the what where the leases are and, and who wins the leases um, and that's going to really drive um, a lot of what what's going to happen in the transmission design and so we're, we're early in that process um, but but we wanted to, to share what what we know and, and, and what, what can happen from here. So with that, I'll pause uh, that sort of a quick overview of, of how we're thinking about this, what our results are showing, uh, and some of those considerations, and I want to open it up uh, for questions. Great. I know there's questions. Dan, go ahead, please. Thanks, Harry. I appreciate it. you put a lot into just a few slides, so um, th thanks for going through that. So can you go back to the demand slide? So the, just so I'm clear, the light blue is where we are now, is that right? Or where we, no, kind of going from where we are now to just to low levels of electrification, but still meeting the targets? Uh, yeah, so all of the scenarios that we're looking at, so th these are New England targets. So so, so the main demand is, is constant and, and, and is the same that we're looking at for all of that. And, and that main demand meets uh, the renewable targets set in Maine. This is sort of looking at, the varying what could happen in New England. Both of these are, are decarbonization levels. So from where we are today, they have, they, depending on when these models were developed, they had different uh, points at 2020. Um, so, so, so sort of really looking at the pace of growth. Um, and so you have this lower. And, and so what we, what we did specifically is looking at um, some of the main climate council work. And, and there was a bunch of different scenarios explored previously. We wanted to leverage that work um, where we could. Um, we did have to do some extrapolating a, a little bit there, but, but trying to show something in, in a, a lower decarbonization level and, and a higher decarbonization level, really trying to understand uh, how different New England demand affects what could happen in the Gulf of Maine. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more if that's okay. Um, sure. well, I think this is just really helpful to show that there's a number of different analysis that are all kind of pointing in the same direction about what the electrification might look like. Um, so appreciate that. Uh, could you go to the next one? Yeah. So the I just wanted to constrain onshore development that includes the a, a number of the policies that have passed. You know, Northern Maine, a lot of the solar that's being developed, um, but kind of stops at that. Is that right? Yeah, that's sort of taking what's what's in policy today, um, and then the pipeline that's already uh, underway. Uh, but but really saying. Not, not, a, not. There's no additional de onshore development in, in that scenario. Okay, okay. So it's not. I mean, some of these may or may not move forward, right? I guess it's kind of the. Um, but it's at least a, from a modeling exercise, um, helpful to see what's what's in the pipeline or could be developed. Um, okay, um, and then two other ones. The on the New England results. Does that include? Is Maine a part of the New England results, or is that on top of the Maine? Results. Yes, Maine is a subset of the New England results. Can you go back to that so we can just see it? Yep. 
uh, so of that 30 so this is for yeah this is all of New England, including Maine. So we we're saying, you know, Maine is about 2,000 megawatt, uh, 2,000 megawatts. Um, so you know, in this base scenario, there's another 1,200 or so um, megawatts, you know, beyond the main need for New England. And so, and but that assumes that Mass is cut, is building out, or all the other states are building out, is to the south of them, right? Yeah, offshore. we factored in what all the other states have. Um, stated or, or legislated or, or try or going after to, to the best of our of our understanding there. Okay, um, sorry. And I'll, so that's I'll sort of ab above and beyond that. Yeah. Turning over the mic after this question. So next slide. Um, this is just obviously the main map. Um, there'd be a, um, and you mentioned this, there's obviously interconnection points for the Gulf of Maine to our south too, um, but that's not included here. Correct. Yep. Yeah, we're focused on sort of the main substations and, and you know, where where these interconnect and how you know what cables are used, what what technology, um, how 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 much cable is needed is, is are all big open questions, and we really need more information from the BOEM planning process about where the lease areas are going to be. Um, right, you know, substations that have lots of headroom might not make sense if they're you know far away from where where the lease areas are going to be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Super. Thanks. Uh, Don Perkins. Thanks. Thanks, David and Ari. Um, so I have a comment and then three questions. My, my comment is, it, I think we have to be very careful about our language describing this as meeting main demand or but you know, this energy goes into the to the, it goes into the grid and it's managed uh, on a regional basis, the new pool basis. And uh, you know, the to the degree this gets cast as we're trying to do offshore wind to serve Maine's needs, I I, I think that's a fiction. Uh, it, it's really to what degree is is the Gulf of Maine going to participate in serving the region's needs? And so we 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 have to be focusing on the region regional realities. And so this comment, um, Dan's last comment about the, the headroom uh, in, in uh, New Hampshire and, and the North Shore of Massachusetts, th those are critical realities to be thinking about. We, we need to understand whether it's easier or harder or, or even possible for this amount of energy to come ashore in Maine uh, versus in New Hampshire or Massachusetts. Um, three questions. Um, Ari, every model is driven by assumptions. And what what are the key assumptions that, that in your model that 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 drive the the allocation of production to offshore wind versus onshore solar uh, wind or other things? Um, and to what degree are those assumptions highly uncertain? Because this is this is a model. Um, but there's a lot of inherent uncertainty to such a model. So first question is, you know, what are the key assumptions? The second is, um, what do we know about grid constraints in Southern Maine uh, that, that really uh, may be a factor in our competitiveness uh, from the eyes of developers uh, or, or BOEM uh, when, when leasing happens? Uh, and then third is, is to what degree is load balancing, uh, intermittent load balancing in the Quebec hydro uh, situation uh, relevant in this modeling exercise and or included in this modeling exercise? Thank you. Great, uh, thanks, Don. Um, see if I can tackle each of those questions. Um, so the first one on key assumptions, um, it really is is really understanding you know, where where this offshore wind would be, uh, which is in federal waters. Um, so there's assumptions about about what technologies are. Um, so it'll be floating technology. Um, you know, how much there, there's some assumptions on how sort of what the cap is of of development. Um, you know, how much offshore wind could be done? How much onshore wind? How much solar? And that's driven for, for some prior analyses that that were done um, there for those resources. Um, and then we're, the other uh, assumption is really cost and trying to understand the cost projections of, of each of those resources. And, and it's really a, a least cost model. I mean, you're right that all these are models. They're all projections and they have assumptions. We're, we're using least cost, looking at um, the projected cost that I shared earlier of, of, of offshore wind 
um, compare that to solar and onshore. And then the other pieces and assumptions are, are sort of the constraints that we put on the model and sort of capping how much could be done. So no, no, no assumption of any kind of political risk uh, in your model. Uh, can you? I guess not, not. Not really. I guess we're using the legislation that that's that's out there. Um, primarily for more on the. You know, that might affect some of the supply constraints in terms of how much could be developed there. That's really how we, we're thinking about it there. So I'm just going to jump in to say we've got a large number of other things we want to go through today. We got a couple extra hands. So um, Ari, if you want to take a quick hit at some other Don's points, and then I want to jump to Terry, Patrice, Grog, I have the last word, and then we need to move on. Yep. Um, I guess the second question on, on constraints, uh, we haven't looked at that as not really within our scope, but I totally agree with you that understanding you know the constraints in in, in the, you know beyond Maine. Um, is going to be important, and, and that's sort of at the regional level there. Um, and then um, you know, the last question on intermittent, um, our analysis was done on an, on an annual basis, and, and um, our, our report on this will be coming out shortly, and that does talk pretty heavily about that. And, and obviously, there are intermittency um, challenges between solar, wind, uh, other resources, and it's something that, that should be studied, studied further. We're looking at the annual basis in, in that. Um, some of the prior studies did Looked at annual, some some looked at sort of hourly basis, and that's you know, some of the, the disparity you see. But but generally, you would need more renewables if you're trying to, to match intermittency and, and need renewable supply. Um, so so our numbers are, are maybe on, on on the lower side if we're looking at annual. If you start getting hourly, um, it's likely that you'll need more. Thanks, Ari. Terry, you're up. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, so uh, I got a just a quick question, couple quick questions. Um, so the $39 you were predicting the cost, when you had that cost curve up, uh, the $39 you were predicting that it would cost per megawatt hour, does that, does that compare to what we're paying now or is that more money than what we're paying now? And then I have a follow-up on the lease price. So. If you could answer that one first, Ari, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's a, a tough one. So let's, let's levelize cost of energy. So that's looking at sort of the, the cost of generation. So what we're paying now has a lot of other pieces in it in terms of the uh, transmission and, and, and everything else um, you know, in, in the bills that we get. That's looking at sort of the cost of, of generation there uh, over time. Uh, okay, so what does that compare? Like $39, what are we paying right now? Is what's the rate pay a pan right now per megawatt to, to produce? I guess that's the question I'm asking. Uh, do you know? Yeah, I don't have that in front of me. I might open that up if anybody else on the on the call is is more information there. Okay. Okay. Then uh, so Bohm, uh, I've been watching this for a long time. I've been involved in offshore wind for uh, ten years or so here, um, and every time they put a lease out the companies are paying more and more and more money for a, a piece of property did you figure that into your scenarios at all there in the models or uh, was that part of the modeling or no no that's not part of the modeling we're looking at sort of demand and supply irrespective of sort of lease costs there. okay all right thank you Thanks, Terry. Patrice, and then I'll circle back if someone wants to talk about the cost thing. But Patrice, go ahead, please. Hang on a second, Patrice. I can't hear you. Sorry, that, that was my bad. Yes. Is that better? Yep, we got it. Okay. You. Um, with with the decarbonization scenario, you're looking at up to over eleven thousand megawatts with the technology that we have now. Is that equating to about eight hundred turbines? in the Gulf of Maine at 14 megawatts? Um, good, good question. I, I don't want to put a hard number on it. I guess there's there's trends in turbine development getting uh, bigger. So um, we're, we're sort of looking at the amount needed, not sort of what size they should be and, and, and whatnot. Um, but right. the trends are you know, from, from 10 to 15 and maybe up to 20 megawatt turbines. Um, yeah, so if I do it by 20 megawatts, we're still looking at 560 turbines, which would then be well over probably 800 feet tall if they're generating that much power. So, all right, I just wanted to make sure that my tightness in my chest was um, 
I was understanding it correctly. Okay, that's a lot. Um, and then my other question is, I've been hearing a lot about hydrogen, and I did notice um, <clears throat> on your energy input graph, you had a growing hydrogen band, but you're not looking at that at all for the for the New England region in terms of meeting our demand. Is that something that's just not reasonable? Is there is there any sort of reason if that's growing as well that we're not considering that for this region on top of everything else? Yeah, good, good question. I think hydrogen is something that that uh, could be considered and maybe should be considered in the future. Um, our modeling didn't really look at that. It's, it's really not an economical uh, solution right now. Um, there's lots of discussion and excitement about hydrogen in the future and, and gives a recommendation in our report is sort of an area of future research that should be done. So, so I agree it's something that should be considered. Great. So in just in the interest of time, not because this isn't really interesting uh, material, I'd love to push forward. If folks have more questions for Ari, I recommend channeling that through me or Stephanie. Um, and we happily will get you directly in touch with Ari and the DMV team to work through some of these questions. Um, and I, But I, I'd love to this morning just keep moving forward on it. Clearly, there's a lot here, right? In the full reports, as Stephanie put in the, in the chat, will be available in the technical studies section of the website. So once we have the final versions, they'll be up there and there'll be a lot of detail in there. So folks who are detail oriented, that's going to be a place to go. Okay. And Grog, are you okay if I move forward to the next thing? Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing we want to do is talk about two pieces, um, which we have under the heading of sort of responsible approach um, for Maine's pathway forward. And the first piece Ari's going to handle um, with us, which is a quick look at what they're doing in their socioeconomic assessment. Uh, he'll say this, I'll say it as well. We're doing um, a briefing on July 14th, and you all should have gotten an optional invite for that, in which we'll go into the detail of this. This is a quick hit, um, but Ari, why don't you go ahead and do this? The second thing we're going to do is around a mapping exercise um, that um, NROC is doing, and we have uh, someone to talk about that as well. But let's go to socioeconomic, and Ari, take it away, please. Great. Uh, thanks, David. I'll, I'll keep going here. Just I know the, I saw Stephanie's link as well. So so uh, we have a couple of reports out there on that site as well. One is the state of the industry. So I'll have a little more detail on that first section of today. And, and the other piece um, is an initial report on the transmission constraints. So some more detail there. So and more things will be coming up there. But now to the socioeconomics. So uh, what I want to do today, as, as David just alluded to, is, is really just um, highlight how we're, how we're thinking about this and what we've done, um, and then encourage everyone to uh, join the July 14th session uh, to really uh, have an opportunity to get into the details here. So um, really just think about overview and objectives and, and, and what we did here. So we're trying to under, identify the potential benefits and costs really to, to society as a whole of offshore development in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and, and to do this, we work with a lot of different stakeholders, many of the folks uh, on this call um, and in the working groups, um, for, uh, some Maine-based professors, uh, really folks in the fishing industries and, and, and uh, community members, both coastal and non-coastal, really to help refine the scope, understand um, what's of interest and, and, and what are you looking for and what's, what's the best way to get this information. Um, of course, we have lots of different groups. There are lots of asks and lots of interests. Uh, and really what we're able to, to produce in this report is, is really is trying to examine, quantify benefits and risks where possible. So um, as, when we get into the report, we'll see um, estimated dollar value of quantifiable incomes and that's, um, you know, for, for economic development, uh, carbon emissions, and, and really health impacts of, of having cleaner air from renewables. And then also some discussion of the things that are more difficult to, to, to quantify and monetize at this time, um, effects on fishing, ports, uh, tourism and recreation, coastal communities, it really comes back to what we were talking about just now on, on transmission, where we need to know more about where these are, uh, maybe into Patrice's comment, what size they might be, how many, uh, where they'll be, uh, really to, to better understand these, these specific impacts. And so what do we do? Uh, we've been doing a lot of things over the last few months here. Uh, we started with a literature review, um, looking at secondary sources, uh, understanding impacts of prior projects and other activities ongoing on fisheries and ocean users, um, ecology, uh, looking at sort of 
before, during, and after prior projects. A lot of those are maybe fixed bottom um, as well. Uh, tourism and recreation, communities and equity. We conducted 64 uh, interviews um, out in the field um, with uh, really broken into three key stakeholder groups, coastal and non-coastal communities, tourism and recreation, and then 31 folks um, in the fishing industry, really trying to understand the perspectives um, and, and where folks are coming from, what they know, what they don't know about offshore wind and, and how, how important it is in, in terms of, uh, in context of, of, of their, their livelihoods and, and everything else ongoing. And finally, we calculated um, economic impacts, really uh, focused on the diverse portfolio scenario, that middle ground that I shared earlier, um, using industry standard tools where available. So uh, for jobs, we looked at NRL's JEDI uh, model, um, really understanding um, as impacts from uh, construction and operation of generation resources. Um, for um, carbon dioxide and looking at, at carbon impacts, we looked at some EIA data, pulling that in there, and then several EPA tools to look at health impacts um, as well. And our, our key finding areas are, are broad and, and wanna, we're not gonna get into detail here in the interest of, of time, but um, a lot of different impacted uh, parties and, and, and uh, we have discussion of all of these and, and what the impacts are. I mean, there's some um, overarching uh, themes, uh, some of which we talked about already, and, and it's really, you know, proactive communication is, is number one, making sure that all of these folks understand what's happening, know where, where it is, where to get more information and, and, and what information is, is out there. Um, and, and we'll have more details of this uh, in the mid-July briefing, which is a teaser for my next slide in terms of what, what we're doing. So Gio will uh, circulate these results with the key stakeholders involved in, in the design and scoping of this work. Uh, as David mentioned, July 14th, we have a briefing open to um, all folks where we'll get into more details here, uh, go through those key finding areas and what we heard uh, from the interviews and, and, and what, um, what information we can pull from the modeling and, and assessment we've done. And then my last point here is, is, is really the theme here is that collaboration is necessary and, and um, you know, these, we can only, we can estimate what we can now and as we learn more about um, where these lease areas might be uh, as Boeing proceeds through their planning and analysis, we'll know more about um, where they could be, what they might look like and, and can help refine on uh, those impacts. Fantastic. Okay, great. In the, um, because we're gonna have that briefing on the 19th, we're gonna skip over questions right now and go to the next set of um, information we have. Thank you. Ari and the whole DNV team, there is clearly an enormous amount of work behind that. Um, like I said, happy to link people up um, directly with Ari and his team uh, to go through all that. The next piece we're doing is about a mapping effort um, uh, to try to understand impact better. And we have from the Northeast Regional Ocean Council or NROC with us today, Emily uh, Shimshenia. And Emily, if I'm butchering your last name, I apologize. Um, and Emily's going to walk us through um, how data is being put together and used um, to think through um, being wise around managing impact uh, from potential offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine. So Emily, let me turn it over to you. I'm happy to share your slides or share them yourself. Ah, I see they're up. Okay. Great. great. Thanks, David. Yeah, so you can see my slides. You can hear me okay? Yeah, it's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and you did a great job with my name. I'm Emily Shamshinia. Um, I'm the manager of the Northeast Ocean Data Portal through the Northeast Regional Ocean Council, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. And I also have with me here today, um, Nick Napoli, who's the executive director of NROC. Um, so just a little bit more about who we are and, and what NROC is. Um, the Northeast Regional Ocean Council began coordinating um, in the mid 2000s. So it was an initiative formed by all of the New England governors at the time. Uh, it has also um, established an ocean planning committee. You can see the URL on the slide here. The ocean planning committee established the Northeast Ocean Data Portal uh, with regional partners in 2009. So we've been working with regional scale ocean data for over a decade. I mean, you may remember around 2016 with the development of the Northeast Ocean Plan, there was a really big push to increase the um, data sets related to ocean uses and ocean resources in New England. 
Um, and as a result, where we sit today is with northeastoceandata.org, um, a fairly mature data portal now. We have thousands of map products that show the footprint of ocean resources and uses throughout New England. Um, and these data sources are derived from multiple authoritative data sources like federal agencies, state agencies, tribes and academic researchers um, and other industry stakeholders participate in the data, providing the data sets um, and informing and vetting them, reviewing them with us through um, volunteer work groups um, and pretty extensive data review uh, processes. And so um, the resulting portal screenshot that you see now, there's multiple ways to obtain the information about data um, for ocean uses and resources, including interactive maps. And we also have several summary pages that give you the status for things um, like offshore wind, offshore wind products, uh, offshore wind projects, and the development stages of all of those various lease areas that we looked at a little bit earlier. So what are we doing for, for this uh, roadmap process? This project responds pretty directly to two independent recommendations from the Environment and Wildlife Working Group and the Fisheries Working Group. Um, both of those recomm recommendations circulated around um, improving existing data or getting a better understanding of what data are out there in the Gulf of Maine related to uh, wildlife, fisheries, other ocean uses and environment data sets. So what this also does, um, what, we're, what we need to be cognizant of, I think, is this timeline. This is a timeline that Boehm put out about Gulf of Maine engagement, how they're um, essentially looking at different milestones in the offshore wind planning process. And it's complicated, but really what we should take away from this slide is that our project aligns with you know, pretty much the beginning of this timeline and is well situated to inform the call area and the identification of that area, as well as the wind energy area. So those two things will happen in early 2023 and later in 2023. Um, but this project is really um, geared towards informing those processes. So you'll see, you know, probably knowledge gained from this project presented or discussed at task force meetings um, and in sort of the deliberations around how you define a call area in the wind energy area. So the timeline for this project is basically formulated so that we can review with your experts and stakeholders what they consider the best available data um, in the region and prepare that over the next six months using the existing data sets we have on the portal as a starting point, um, doing you know, some improvements to those data that make it more customized to the Gulf of Maine, um, including adding new federal fisheries data, new data sets from Maine DMR, um, potentially new visualizations, and adding additional context to help interpret those environment, wildlife, and fisheries data sets. Um, and then we're also preparing uh, some uh, recommendations for the next 12 months that would help inform that wind energy area finalization for what additional improvements could be made that build on that best available that we currently have. So what could improve data um, so that you have the, you know, even more than, than what's currently available um, and, and well suited to answering the questions you need to answer. Um, another big component of this work, um, and this is sort of winding down here now, um, is this Gulf of Maine portal. So we've developed this password protected website. It looks just like the regional ocean data portal, but it's com completely customized and focused on the Gulf of Maine. There are folders for each state to, to contribute um, its own analyses or own data sets, own visualizations. Those are each also password protected. So folks have a lot of control over whether they're still reviewing those data with stakeholders, or whether they're ready to share with other states, if they're ever ready to share with other states in the region. Um, we, we don't know exactly how folks will be using this, but we're presenting it here as a product that um, it can serve as a workspace to do this sort of iterative and collaborative approach that I think is envisioned in the roadmap. Um, and hopefully it helps facilitate that process even beyond the scope of this small project. Um, and, and NROC and other partners in the region are, are really looking uh, toward advancing this Gulf of Maine portal so that it may, is maintained as that workspace, uh, like I said, beyond the timeline of this particular project. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions about this. Just a quick overview and our contact information is here 
feel free to reach out if you have questions about data and, and interactive maps and portals and the like. Super. Thanks, Emily. And since this is the first time we've been presenting this to the advisory committee, some folks were involved in a, in a workshop uh, which occurred a few weeks ago. But if, if anybody has questions, we have a, just a few moments here to do some questions for Emily. Um, otherwise, same thing applies. Happy to put you in touch. Happy to give folks more information about the mapping that's going on and will go on uh, even beyond the work of this roadmap. Um, so just any quick follow-up for Emily right now? Great, okay, super. Emily, thanks so much, that was really clear. Um, great. Um, so the last thing we wanted to do with folks today um, is to look at the supply chain and workforce um, technical work that's gone on. And for that, we've got um, Exodus and BW Research. And we'll start with Exodus and the supply chain work. Um, here we've got Jamie McDonald um, as part leading up the team there. And I also thought I saw Andy 1.2. But Jamie, let me turn it over to you and um, to walk us through the supply chain um, work that you've been to doing over the last several months. Thanks, David. And just com confirming that everyone can hear me and see my screen okay? Yep, you're good on both fronts. Excellent. So uh, yeah, we're going to give a quick update on the work we've been doing, looking at um, you know the opportunities for Maine uh, with regards to the supply chain uh, for offshore wind. Um, so I'm going to click through my slides here. Um, but just to kind of take you back to December 2021, these were the top five takeaways that, that we were looking at. Uh, first one being getting a good understanding of the offshore wind states playbook that uh, other states have been looking at and what it means for Maine. Uh, pulling out regional collaboration that uh, brought agreement there that this needed to happen. And it sounds like from what Dan was saying at the start of this call, steps are being taken in that direction, which is great to hear. Uh, third was to look, start identifying and looking at business attraction, you know, in particular, looking at those tier ones organizations that support offshore wind and how do we potentially attract one to, to Maine and what does, what does that look like? Uh, fourth, leveraging the key exportable opportunities. So supporting Maine organizations that want to be involved in offshore wind or are already involved in offshore wind and uh, finally balancing accelerating offshore wind project pipeline and supply chain with, with stakeholder engagement management. And um, this presentation is really gonna focus on the two bold points there in terms of three of four, in terms of business attraction and supporting main organizations. To understand the tier one landscape, we looked at the OEMs and tier ones that have, you know, anchored roots here in the US already uh, and what really drives that and influences the location of these uh, organizations, whether it be blades, cables, nacelles, foundations, towers and, and, and transition pieces, really comes down to the presence of existing infrastructure and availability of Keyside area, uh, whether those states have either explicit or implicit local content goals, uh, the availability of financial support from project developers, so contract commitments, and our state agencies. And I think that bottom one, particularly important if anyone's aware of New York and their OREC solicitation and their, and their requirement for a supply chain plan to include either a, a blades and cells or cables facility as part of the, the OREC solicitations. So understanding those organizations, their size has allowed us to, to look into a demand versus estimated supply capacity for these, for these key components. So we've looked at the projected volume capabilities of these uh, OEMs or tier one facilities and done that through uh, either su supply chain press releases or commitments from project de developers. And on those graphs there, the, that's the, the background bolded out um, uh, part of the graph. And each supply element, we've estimated the demand as well based on uh, the projects that are committed and the lease areas we've seen and estimations of what that means for fixed and floating demand as we go out through to 2035 here on the graph. As you can see, you know, there, there looks like there's opportunities and things like towers and the cells. We believe those gaps are going to be closed by other states as the fixed wind industry accelerates prior to uh, prior to the floating wind industry. We took a look back at our supply chain baselines uh, and looked at 
know, we, we see that Maine has a great strength in project development services, and that is really a, a great anchor for, for development and exportable opportunities and for the Gulf of Maine uh, development opportunities when they arise. But also shows that when we start getting into the physical supply of components beyond these development services, there's a key opportunity for Maine to support uh, in the floating wind supply chain elements. So dynamic array cables, anchors and moorings, floating foundations, the primary structures associated with that. And that really is a, a, national, a national supply chain gap. So uh, there's a real opportunity there for Maine to potentially um, you know, look at, at, at capturing some of that market. So but looking at, you know, where they've established, what the supply and demand is, and where we're seeing um, uh, those gaps in the potential supply chain there, we've, we've identified um, some key areas where Maine has an opportunity to develop. And to do that, we've assessed it in terms of a Porter Five Forces framework. So it's an industry understood and recognized framework for understanding the competitive intensity of, of these supply chain elements. Uh, project development services, uh, great base load there, but there's a real opportunity for Maine to attract a uh, balance of client companies, uh, components unique to floating wind markets. So there's less established competition there and a lot more room for innovation. So looking at things like moorings, anchors and ancillaries, dynamic cables and ancillaries, floating substructure, design, construction, handling of subcomponents. Another key opportunity we've identified is for main ports is to support this, you know, the East Coast market well ahead of the, the floating market. Um, so that is a, an, another key area where we believe Maine has a supply chain opportunity. The next stage we looked at was how do we support Maine organizations that are already in offshore wind and want to continue to expand their services and be involved in offshore wind and support new companies to get involved in offshore wind. To do that, we uh, conducted some engagement with uh, a, a, a few companies there and uh, identified some key opportunities, but also sp specific challenges to developing offshore wind uh, supply chain in Maine. Uh, and some, here were some of the key things we were hearing. So we were hearing Maine knows maritime, we have competent engineers, advanced technology, and knowledge of the maritime industry, and we should be should be making sure we we take advantage of that. Policy uncertainty is the greatest risk to development of an offshore wind project pipeline, and that you know, get a, you know doesn't uh, provide the confidence that they, some people need to get involved in offshore wind. Uh, May needs to build trust with fishing and the maritime industry to successfully implement offshore wind. And there's still a lot of information around offshore wind infrastructure that needs to be addressed. So these were the, some of the key outputs that we were hearing from that engagement. From that, we developed some uh, further preliminary recommendations and just want to stress here that these recommendations you will see filtered through with the, the working group's recommendations. They've been uh, done in, in parallel, in coordination with the working group. So there's Nothing here that should be a surprise to the working group. And, and uh, as a result, all should be filtered through to yourselves. We've identified these in kind of four key areas and that's market. So um, first one, identifying a group to implement economic development programs and that focus on attracting new and existing companies to Maine and the offshore wind industry. Yeah. Work with the developers to understand where their experience gaps are in their supply chains and what they would, what they like to see in offshore wind uh, supply chain development, and create a plan to promote the capability of of main firms. From a policy perspective, develop a long term implementation plan uh, connected to those community needs and to help them navigate and mitigate offshore wind implementation challenges, and plan for a simple and straightforward permitting process for offshore wind development. In terms of investment, work with developers to understand their critical needs for port and infrastructure services, invest in and position a, a, a main port to support what those needs may be, uh, and create a plan for increasing the available housing needed by the offshore wind industry workforce. This is actually something we're hearing a lot up and down the East Coast, establishment of ports, but no suitable uh, industry or, or housing to support, support the workforce that's needed there. 
And, and finally, in terms of innovation, support flowing wind researchers in applying for federal grants, and then fostering those programs and that, that learning, um, that real capability in AI, data science, and machine learning that we've, we've seen and link that specifically to the offshore wind industry. Um, and, that is, and that is it from, from us. Fantastic. Thanks, Jamie. Great. As Jamie said, you'll see in those last two slides, when you see the recommendations coming out of the supply chain workforce imports and marine, uh, marine transportation working group, you'll see those echoes in those. Um, we have a few minutes for questions for Jamie and his team uh, before we go to the workforce development piece specifically. So if anybody has some questions about what Jamie was looking at, what the Exodus folks were doing, we have time for that if folks uh, have some comments or questions for Exodus. Grog, go ahead, please. Hang on one second, Grog, you're on mute still. Oh yeah, that pesky little mute button. <laughs> anyway, um, thanks to all of you uh, for the briefings this morning and very informative and will help us immensely. Jamie, I had one question on the whole supply chain thing, uh, you know, it is a competitive environment and, you know, everybody's going to go where they get, where, where the costs are the most competitive. So, you know, and so relative to our neighbors, New Hampshire and primarily probably Massachusetts, but also to a lesser extent down to Connecticut and greater Northeast, how competitive do you think our uh, industrial basis uh, in, in this market space and uh, you know the, and as Don has pointed out repeatedly, uh, that this is not a main decarbonization plan. It's a regional decarbonization plan. Energy is fungible and it goes into the New England grid. Uh, you know, do do you think there are benefits for the for Maine's industrial capacity to serve this offshore industry? Uh, uh, the entire northeast sure yeah so i think in terms of competitiveness at the moment it is hyper competitive um to when considering where these turbine oems uh, and tier ones pertinent to fixed wind are going to land within the what well, within the previous probably two years and probably looking out to the next 18 months and hopefully, as we see New York's solicitation and New Jersey's solicitation kind of filtered down, we should kind of see some of those OE ones, uh, OEMs and tier ones kind of having their anchor spots. And that should give a, a clearer landscape uh, to um, where we think there is the potential for Maine to potentially attract an OEM. We've seen a lot of these facilities anchor themselves around ports and infrastructure. So to increase the competitiveness of land of Maine for landing one of these uh, uh, type of companies, I think we need to see that the commitment to a poor infrastructure for offshore wind being developed. And I think that's an, an important uh, important milestone to make in order to get that attraction and and be competitive. Yeah, and so what I was getting at is, you know, anticipating ahead of need and having the state make critical investments you mentioned ports for instance or try to find ways to incentivize industries in the state we do have some you know major contractors here that have done work in this area but particularly the mostly the onshore because that's what we have now and i think they're competitive but to uh you know encourage them to you know to be competitive and to start getting involved in this. And so I guess I'm looking for suggestions from what you've learned. If we were to make these ahead of need investments, where would be the best places to make them? Yeah, and I think for us, it's definitely focused around floating infrastructure and to support the floating wind industry. Um, you know, there's things, anchors and moorings we've already uh, mentioned to uh, there, you already have an organization focused on the ancillaries to support dynamic cables, you know, so really leverage um, yeah, organizations to support secondary steel. So, there, you know, there, 
there is some of those kind of leveled down, you know, almost tier two, tier 1.5 type organizations that uh, we should be giving support to and seeing how they can also support the fixed wind industry up and down the East Coast as well. And I think that's something in the, uh, the one of the recommendations when talking about main organizations we were, we were trying to focus on there is trying to develop a plan really to support those organizations that are almost ready now to support uh, the offshore wind industry. Yeah, I, I would think ports and, and what you just mentioned and also tr the transmission capacity, uh, trying to uh, portals to bring it that are ahead of need. That could be very helpful, but thank you. Now I'm on mute. Um, I want to shift gears uh, to the workforce stuff. Um, so we have enough time to see the work of Exodus partner of BW Research. And we've got Nate Hunt here uh, from BW to walk us through the, um, the workforce specific analysis that's been done. So Nate, I'll turn it over to you. We'll definitely have some time on the back end for questions for Nate. And if there's follow-up questions for Exodus as well, we can do that. But Nate, go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Nate Hunt. I'm a project manager at BW Research. Um, I'm also joined by Phil Jordan, who is the vice president of BW Research, um, and he's on to um, kind of add any additional context and, and respond to any questions too. Um, so, so yeah, to, to jump in, um, what we did for the kind of the workforce analysis side of things um, is we looked at the kind of the current state of the, the kind of potential workforce or, and, and the current workforce um, the education and training providers around the state and kind of their capacity and expertise and kind of their ability to produce, um, you know, talent in, in specific offshore wind uh, type occupations. Um, and we also held um, a number of kind of convenings with different stakeholders, um, including employers and industry groups, um, educators and training providers, um, and organized labor as well. Um, and so, what kind of I'll walk through here is our really quick assessment of kind of the current state of the education and training in, in the state as it pertains to offshore wind. Um, then I'll go into a few of our um, recommendations that we kind of developed um, and you know worked with um, kind of alongside the working group. So our recommendations do align um, really, really closely with, with what you will all see through the working group's recommendations. Um, and yeah, uh, the, the final thing that I do want to note before we, we jump in is that this is a very, very, very condensed version um, of our report and all of our research. Um, so, you know, if you do have any additional questions beyond today, I'm happy to answer any, certainly, but the report contains a lot of information as well. So I'd kind of, um, you know, uh, recommend that as well. So to start off, um, thinking about uh, the current education and training kind of environment, um, the kind of the, one of the things that really stuck out to us the most is that UMaine's Advanced Structures and Composite Center um, really is a key competitive advantage um, for the state of Maine to both kind of attract, retain, and really advance um, offshore wind talent, um, both nationally and internationally. Uh, as, as Jamie you know, just, just mentioned previously, um, this is kind of an, an area of expertise that's unique to Maine, um, particularly with floating offshore wind. Um, and so thinking about um, some of the kind of talent development, but also um, that, that can span into economic development as well. Um, we also, in the report, we go into the offerings of community colleges and four-year institutions. Um, so those are kind of covered as well. But in this presentation, one other thing that I really wanted to emphasize was there's actually a, a pretty good number of registered apprenticeship programs. Um, we found 67 through um, different kind of training providers, including organized labor. But we know that there's some through organized labor that, that isn't counted in that 67 as well. So that 67 is a really, it's kind of a low watermark um, number. So um, we see registered apprenticeships as a really good opportunity to um, you know, train a number of individuals um, through earn and learn opportunities, uh, which is uh, um, definitely a great way to kind of expand accessibility. Um, and then when we look at kind of wind specific training itself, uh, we found 10 different programs across seven different institutions. 
um, within the state. And those programs ranged from electrical and structural uh, engineering programs to uh, really onshore wind technicians. Um, but the, the broader region as a whole, um, when we looked at kind of New England and actually uh, into Eastern Canada as well, um, there were 35 kind of additional uh, wind specific trainings in surrounding states. So, um, you know, not only is Maine kind of uh, already, you know, pretty developed in its at least onshore wind specific training uh, and, 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 and soon offshore um, and some of the kind of the overlap there, but regionally it's, it's strong as well. Um, next, um, as, as Ari and, and Jamie just talked about, um, there's really a number of opportunities for Maine workers and Maine businesses, um, both in and outside of the state as it pertains to offshore wind. Um, and those opportunities are also kind of available in the immediate, short, and longer term. Um, and so in kind of the immediate term, um, when we look at the kind of current um, composition of Maine's workforce. One thing that we noted is that there's a really high concentration of offshore wind uh, related workers or occupations. So roles like uh, marine engineers, zoologists, atmospheric scientists, survey mapping technicians, um, and just general uh, strong maritime expertise um, and a lot of folks who work on or around the water um, those types of skill sets um, and backgrounds are really important to a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the work that really starts in the planning and development stages, but will also be continued without or continued throughout, um, you know, these offshore wind projects. So whether that's, um, you know, marine mammal monitoring or um, marine transportation, there's really a lot of opportunities there, um, both in kind of the Gulf of Maine going forward, um, but also further down the coast. Um, and, um, off of off of other states. So um, you know, main businesses um, really employ a large, uh, a high concentration. Um, it's really kind of a strong industry cluster um, of these types of workers who are essential to offshore wind work. And so, right off the bat, um, kind of a, a quick win is um, you know supporting these businesses as they look to to support some of this offshore wind work. Um, when we think about uh, maybe a little bit longer term, or at least not the not the immediate term, as I said before, um, I don't think I'd be surprising anyone to say that the uh, current state of the labor market is is challenging for a lot of employers. Um, very very difficult to find talent um, and find qualified talent um, as well, right? And there's not a lot of slack in the labor market um, with unemployment pretty much approaching what we call that natural rate of unemployment. Um, there's not really a lot of opportunity to uh, find folks who are you know, looking for work, but uh, can't seem to find work. So thinking about kind of the expanded economic opportunities that, that this offshore wind work will bring, um, you know, we think that it's really important to um, expand upon the uh, existing uh, labor pool. And one way to do that is to engage students um, kind of early on. So in middle, uh, high school, and I guess in, in some cases it could be elementary if it's you know reading books about uh, offshore wind or something. Um, but we, um, we kind of focused our, our recommendations on this area um, with the help of a number of stakeholders. Um, we held a stakeholder convening with uh, training and education providers around the state. Um, and some of the ideas that they generated um, were to coordinate visits um, to offshore wind facilities in other states for students um, to really kind of in create or develop um, kind of a curriculum for high school students that A, supports kind of the development of STEM skills, um, but B, maybe even highlights how those um, you know, STEM skills translate to offshore wind uh, kind of careers, certifications, and, and opportunities. Um, and then we also, um, you know, it was also mentioned that uh, some sort of summer program for, for high school students to get some hands-on experience so they can see firsthand what some of these opportunities might be uh, is another way to kind of expand that, that labor pool. Um, you know, while we are thinking about the idea of kind of creating a new workforce or, or um, you know, uh, essentially growing a, a really nascent industry, 
um, we see that there's a really strong opportunity to um, ensure that training programs and workforce kind of initiatives are, are geared towards developing a representative workforce. So um, when we look at the kind of current mix of occupations that are offshore wind related, but working throughout the state of Maine, we see that women only make up 37% of those roles. Um, and that's not um, that's not specific to offshore wind or, or anything like that. It's really driven by kind of industry-wide trends where, um, you know, construction and manufacturing workers are predominantly male. Um, so, you know, thinking about different strategies that might kind of bring that closer to balance uh, where women, you know, make up 50% of the, the workforce overall. Um, other opportunities to kind of expand the workforce and, and um, build something that's more uh, representative uh, could be reaching out to community-based organizations and immigrant community leaders um, to you know, highlight the training um, and education opportunities and, and employment opportunities that are available. Um, and then also thinking about the expansion side of things, um, connecting the education and employment opportunities to support services like childcare, transportation, um, housing even is something that, that was kind of brought up a, a number of times. Um, and also remedial education. So ensuring that folks have kind of the, the fundamental math skills, uh, particularly um, that are, um, you know, really essential in a lot of these, these roles. Um, I realized that was a lot of material, but I, th I think we're just about reaching the mark for questions. Um, so I'm happy to take any at this time. Thanks, Nate. And as you mentioned, there's a lot more detail in the report that you have done and will be finalizing shortly. Grant, go ahead, please. I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, as far as veterans are concerned, the Helmets to Hard Hats is a good program to, to sneak in there. And that um, through the apprenticeship grant in the state of Maine, the AFL-CIO, sorry about that. Wow. Um, the AFL-CIO is putting on somebody in their, in their main office for a uh, pre-apprenticeship. So um, they're gonna run a pre-apprenticeship pre program with the laborers, which um, will take people into the trades. And then from there, they can select the uh, union trade that they would like to go into. So um, there's been a lot of development here in the state of Maine to try to run something like building pathways is in Massachusetts. So this will be the first steps for that. And they will have a team member assigned just for that. That's great, Grant. Super. And as uh, Jamie mentioned as well, um, Nate and his team has worked closely with the workforce folks in the supply chain workforce development ports group. And so you'll see a lot of these themes in the workforce recommendations because of that work together that Nate's been doing with Phil. Okay, anything else folks on the um, questions for Nate on workforce? Great, okay. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Phil, for all that work. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if you want some more information, you've got two pathways, uh, committee members. One is um, stay tuned for the final versions of the reports coming out from the consultants. They'll be posted online. We'll definitely give you a heads up when we have new stuff coming out. Second is reach out to Stephanie Watson, um, and Stephanie can organize ways to make sure if you need to have a conversation with the consultants or something like that, um, she's your pathway to do that. Okay, great. Um, so that was a ton of stuff. We're going to finish now at half past the hour. Um, and um, what we wanted to do is just take a moment and talk about next steps um, and think a little bit about what all this means for um, our work in July. Um, let me just say two quick things about July, and then I have a question for you that I want to do. Um, first thing about July, we have in your calendars a block right now that's like nine to noon, but I had said in an email, we're probably going to be taking a little bit more time so we can really dive into those recommendations, what it means for the roadmap. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you can block on your calendars more like 9.30 to 2, um, that's probably what we're going to do. We're going to do it in person. I wish I had the venue to tell you right now, but we're between two or three venues right now. It will be in the middle of Maine. It won't be up in, um, it will not be up in Orono. We'll do it in Augusta or Brunswick or maybe Waterville. Um, and we're just 
solidifying those venues and, and in person. Um, we will stream it, but we think it'll be not a particularly great experience for folks who need to do it online. Um, so we really encourage you to do that in person. Uh, and, and please do block your calendars in that sort of nine to two range. Um, and we'll send you out an agenda shortly uh, with a confirmed location. Um, and Laura, if I've messed anything up, please let me know. Is, is that right? Okay, good. Okay, so, um, and one thing we just wanna, in the two minutes we have left, um, Samanish, if you could throw just to um, yes, to the panelists, Remember we've done these mentees before, you click on that link, it's in the chat right now. And sorry, this is just for the advisory committee members. And it asks you of the information we've reviewed today, what struck you as especially important to carry forward into Maine's roadmap? Put your name or your initials behind it um, so that we know who's saying what. And then we'll have a nice little interface. Uh, Samanish can show us what everybody's writing, but just let's take 60 seconds Think about this for a second. We threw a ton of stuff at you today. What do you want to make sure you absolutely carry forward into our July conversations when we have all these recommendations in front of us? All right, so click on that link. If it's confusing, advisory committee members, shout out right now. I'm happy to walk you through it. Click on the link. The shorter, the better, honestly. So just write a short phrase, put your name or initials behind it, and we'll wait just a second. And once Samanish starts to see some results, she can share a screen with those results. Does anybody need help clicking on that link and getting to that question? Okay, great. Let's just take a minute and I'll let folks talk, or excuse me, think. Hey, can I ask a silly question? Yeah. How do I send a message that I so you should be able to click um, on the submit button. So you you type in the little uh, box there. Yeah, and I did. Click submit, and it's gone. You got it. If you click submit it, it should be good. And Samanis, you can start to share your screen once you see a few responses. Yeah. If you're having a hard time, just throw it in the chat too. It, you don't have to use this mechanism. Yeah, but that's what I did. I did chat, and I can't seem to make it go anywhere except stare me in the face. Oh no. Let's see when Samana shares her screen if you see it. We have three responses so far. Okay. Great. If you're having a hard time, you can use the Zoom chat as well or open up your mic and just say it. That's happy. That's a perfectly good way to do it. We're we're a small crew today. I'm reading the responses. I hope I encourage you to do the same. All right, folks, we're at the bottom of the hour. Um, we will share this screen with you um, in a meeting summary. Um, thanks everybody for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Um, like I say, uh, we encourage everybody to try to be able to be in person on July 20th, block that nine to two, Augusta, Brunswick, maybe Waterville, <laughs> we'll confirm that ASAP. And thanks everyone for all the effort you're putting into this. Thanks to the consultants for all the effort of putting into it. Dan or Grog, any last words to finish up? No, no I'm thanks. Good. Thanks. That was great. Wonderful. All right, everybody, reach out to me with any questions on practicalities. Um, look forward to seeing you July 20th, if not sooner, on some other Zoom. Uh, all the best. Have a great day, everybody.